you, Lord. We bless you, God. It's all about you, Lord, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, God. Thank you, God. You're welcome to send your presence to walk with you, Lord. You. To know about you, Lord. We want to learn about you, God. Feed us tonight. We hunger for you, Lord. We hunger for your spirit. We hunger for your truth, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's clap our hands one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We hunger to know you. We hunger for fellowship with you, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We're continuing on. A couple of weeks ago, I started this lesson, Abiding in Christ, and I just feel like that's where we need to go tonight. I want to abide in Christ. He's the love of your life that will never walk away from you. That's right. He is. He's a relationship that will never be abusive. He will never use you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He's faithful. I love this scripture in Hosea 2, 19 through 20. Pastor, could you write some scripture for us tonight? Uh, here's some... Here's some these some dry erase markers there we go so Hosea 2 verses 19 through 20 and I will betroth thee unto me forever this is the Lord talking yea I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the Lord you know, when I was marrying my husband, all the things that I wanted, God provided. And I can see the Lord going, you know what? Yes, if you marry me, if you love me, if you enter into this covenant relationship with me, this is how I want to treat you. This is what I want to give to you. Oh, no, not those. Okay. I got this. Here in this eraser. He wants us to have righteousness. He wants us to have judgment. He wants us to partake of his loving kindness and his mercy. Yeah, God has commandment. We've talked about it. Commandment and promise. Every time you see a commandment in the scripture, there's also a promise with it. God is not just saying, go do this, go do that. No, there's a promise. And he keeps his promises. Just try him. Try him out. See if he will. In fact, he even said it when he was talking about tithes. See if I won't pour you out a blessing. Try him today. See what he has for you. See if it's worth it to abide in Christ. I guarantee you, he won't let you down. God has promised that he would be faithful to us. He said, I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness. And I shall know the Lord. He's not like the Wizard of Oz. Remember that movie where in the end Dorothy was trying to get home and she's, uh, nobody can help her and she, they said, go see the wizard at the Wizard of Oz and really it was just a guy behind a curtain. We're not going to come to the end of our life and find that God's just some guy behind a curtain. That's not who he is. That is not who he is. We talked about how as we abide in the church, that God has that plan for us. Even when sometimes people in the church don't behave, God doesn't misbehave in the church. God doesn't play favorites. I love that. That's one of the things that's helped me the most is realizing that every blessing he has. I mean, my husband's called to minister. He's called to preach. I'm not called to preach. I'm a teacher. I do have a calling to teach on my life. But what if all the promises were just for the preachers? Well, there goes my promises. There's, I'm left out. That's just not the way it is. It's worth it to abide in the church. We can stay in the church where there's power, where there's life. We can have it. We can have everything God promised to us. Because that's what he does when he says... It is thus. Let's look up that scripture. Can you and your, uh, when God stretched forth his hand, who can turn it back? Do you have your, you have your phone with you? Yeah. Uh, no, it's uh, when he stretches forth his hand, 
who can turn it back, what he's purposed in his heart, who can disannul it. If you can find that, find it and, we'll, and let me know when you get it. Well, we've talked about the different elements of abiding in God, abiding in the work of the Lord. We want to be faithful in that. Because there's a reward. God's not going to forget your labor of love. He's promised it. God wants to use your life and my life for his glory, and we can be faithful. Now we're going to talk a bit about abiding in the fire. A fire can be warm and, and life-sustaining. We need fire in our life. We do. Amen. The winter's coming for too long. It'll be cold. Yes, that's right. And I like to bundle up. I love a, a nice warm sweater. But I, I especially love on a cold day to get to go in and stand by a heater or stand sit in front of a fire. My husband knows I love sugar-free Hills Brothers mocha cappuccino. <laughs> it's a mix. You can make yourself your own cappuccino. It's a lot cheaper than Starbucks. Try it. You'll love it. It's the closest thing I can have as I'm doing the low-carb diet. It's the closest thing I can have to hot chocolate that doesn't put a bunch of sugar in me. So I love it. But fire can also kill you. It can consume you. Nobody likes to get burned, but there's remarkable things in the spirit when we abide in the fire. And why is that? Who, who can turn to Deuteronomy 4.24? All right, swords up. You got a Bible? Justin, did you forget your Bible? You can get my get in my purse and get my Bible. Go ahead, Justin. Four De Deuteronomy 4.24, swords up. First one there. Stand up and read it. You got your Bibles? Maybe the pastor or Elizabeth, you can use the pastor's Bible right there. Yeah, maybe you can use that. Deuteronomy 4.24. I don't have any candy bars. Swords up. Go ahead. Look for it, Justin. Whoever's the first. Look it up. On your mark and set, go. Find it. All right. Stand and read it, Brother Gyra. Okay. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire. And you know, it says that again in Hebrews 12.29. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. It's the will of God for us to go through the fire. The fire is the word of God in action, through trial, through testing and tribulation. It's for our cleansing. God wanted the men of war to be clean after a battle, so when they brought back the spoils of war, everything they touched was to be put through the fire or washed in water. Did you know that? I didn't know that until I was studying this. And for certain things to be used, they had to abide in the fire. Let's turn to Numbers 31, 21 through 24. Numbers 31, 21 through 24. Can anybody get to that? Numbers 31, 21 through 24. I want you to be looking these up. Tonight I'm going to get a little participation going. Numbers chapter 31, verses 21 through 24. We're going to find out what God had in mind. If you got it, stand up and start reading. Okay, go ahead, Liz. Okay, and that's it. Verse. All right. All right. So if you'd been out and having to fight, and you've been out having to mix with the world, God still had ordinances, still had laws of separation. That's a whole lesson to itself. Study separation. This week, who would look up two scriptures a day and write them down on separation? Who would do that? Just every day. You're going to look it up, write it down, start your notebook. Who could do that? Just two. Look up the word separation or the word separate. See what God has to say about it. 
we're not going to be like everybody else out there. We're, we're in the world. We're part of it. We have, but this isn't our home. And God was trying to show them this example. Okay, you got to go do what you do out in the world. But when you're coming back to spend time with me, you're going to come back among God's people. I want it to be tried by fire. I want you to be clean. I want you to be separate. God still has that method of cleaning, purifying, and separation for his people in Jesus Christ, who is like a refiner's fire. Start looking up Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Malachi 3, write that down, Pastor. Malachi 3, 1 through 4. And if we want to be used of God, we must abide the fire too. Do we want to offer an offering unto the Lord? Then we need to abide the fire. All right. Anybody got Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 4? All right. I'll read this one for time's sake. But be ready, because I'm going to ask you all to read. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years. Again, we see the reference to fire, gold, and silver, and the offering. But what gold and silver is this scripture referring to? It's us. It's you. It's me. It's every living soul. What started on the day of Pentecost when the fire sat on each of them is happening today. That's who this is talking about, that refiner. It's talking about Jesus Christ coming to his people to refine them as gold is refined. See, they could understand that. I've taught it before a little bit. I, I've, I've uh, mentioned it of how a Hebrew bride, uh, when she would adorn herself, there was more gold and silver on her than almost than there was bride. They went and borrowed all the gold that they could take. And so God was using an alliteration, an example that they could understand. Ooh, I'm supposed to be like gold? Yes. That's going to purify you. There's a process that happens. Uh, when the goldsmith is at work and it's in the fire and it, they keep it on that fire until all the dross is burned out and that gold pure gold it's right there it's unmixed you know what it means to be holy unmixed we're not mixed with anything we're about being pure we got to go through the fire. So to us, those things that we call trials are things that we're not used to. It's not so easy. Hey, we passed the first grade. I know all my alphabet. Now it's time for me to learn how to read and write in the spirit. Oh, I got some foundational things. Yes, I spoke in tongues. I got the Holy Ghost. I got baptized in Jesus' name. Now it's time to start some maturity, some discipleship, where we walk in things and we start dealing with circumstances and God doesn't want us to respond the way we used to. Somebody says something to us or flips us off on the highway. Maybe in the old days we would have done it back. God's leading us to something and where we got to control ourselves. Go through the fire. Go through the fire. Let him refine you. And you feel But yet there's that tug of war going on. The flesh lusts against the spirit. And the spirit lusts against flesh. Galatians 5. Read about it. Are you surprised that you feel a struggle sometimes where you... You want to do evil, but you don't want to. The Holy Ghost is, is talking to you, yet your emotions are in play, and something's happened, and you're, you're frustrated, yet you know. You know what God wants you to do. And if you're a wise man, stay in the fire. Say, not my will, but thy will be done. Right. Let him refine you. You're in the finer. God, God's getting that dross worked out in, in every kind of circumstance. Uh, with people you know, with people you don't know. With people that love you and people only that were supposed to love you. People that have never spoke to you. Maybe it's with money. Maybe it's with paying your tithes and being faithful. When you'd rather 
spend it on something else. Or maybe you've got bills and it's tough. You're in that fire and you, you want to be faithful, yet it's not physically easy to your flesh and your feelings. Oh, I'll just give you a, a heads up. Faith isn't always a feel-good thing. But God's trying to wean us. He's trying to take that past fire away from us. I don't need to feel good all the time for God's word to be true, for it to be active in me. Everyone say, I don't need to feel good. I don't know you need to feel good. All the time. I don't need to feel good to be faithful to God. It's not what it's about. And God, you'll go through these things. But what started at Pentecost, it's happening. People are still seeing the fire of the Holy Ghost fall on filling hungry souls with the spirit of the living God because his word abides faithful. And Jesus is everything the word of God says he is. All right, Luke 3, 16. First one that gets there, stand up and read it. Luke chapter 3, verse 16. Let's see if God did exactly what he said he was going to. There's a promise in this. Luke 3.16. No wonder the disciples could say, because we just studied about joy, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. They knew that being in the fire was a good thing, meant they were drawing closer to God. Read it, Brother Gyra. John answered, saying unto them, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I come in, and that latch of whose suit I'm not worthy. Yes. Who has that happened to here? Does this happen to you? Raise your hand. It happened to me. It's happened to every one of us. They, some try to argue about the baptism of the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues. Okay, that was, it happened in Bible history, but it's not for us today. I guess they never read the book of Joel where he says, In the last days I shall pour out my spirit upon all flesh. What, what grade do you have to be in to understand the difference between last or after a while? Jesus didn't say, well, towards the end days, you know, I'll pour out my spirit and I'll flush. No, he said in the last days. So if this happened back in history, was God lying? Was he lying when he said, no, in the last days? How could this have just been an event in past history and not be happening now? Some people have bought into a lie. It's a lie that God doesn't pour out his spirit. Oh, that happened back to Peter and Paul who said, I speak in tongues more than you all. Paul wrote those words. So when somebody says, well, you know, that was a part of history, you say, yes, it was. And it's also a current event. And it's going to happen until the Lord comes. Because he says, the last days. So as long as another day keeps coming, God's going to keep doing it. If we ask him. Because it says, if you, you know, after you, if you ask for a fish, will he give you a stone? If you ask for bread, will he give you a serpent? How much more? Will your father give the Holy Ghost to them and ask him? So I want it. So are we really surprised that we could go through the fire when he said, what we're going to get is the Holy Ghost and fire. Holy Ghost. Don't fear the fire. So when we face a trial and our faith is tested, we don't need to get all that upset about it. Stand up in faith, knowing that God's in charge. He's a consuming fire. So who's in charge of your trial today? If you feel like, I'm in the fire, God. Oh, help me, help me. He's like, okay, here I am. Lean on me. Here I am. In fact, Peter wrote it this way, 1 Peter 4, write this down, Pastor, 1 Peter 4, verses 12 and 13. Who wants to read it? Find it, stand up and read it. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. It's all about our destiny. So when you find that, stand up and read it. 1 Peter Chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Pastor's writing it on the board right now. When you find it, stand and read. It's good for us instead of just listening, but to get that Bible out and see these scriptures yes. and read them. And oh, it's right there. It's in my Bible. Or I looked it up on my phone in that Bible app. Okay, so I'll let you share that after 
Let's read this one. 1 Peter 4, verses 12 and 13. Anybody there yet? Uh, yeah. All right, read it, Brother Gyra. Behold, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing had happened unto you. We rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when in the boat, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. All right. When his glory is revealed. When is his glory revealed? Here's a little test for you. Can you do what God asks of you? Can you obey him without it hurting? When is his glory going to be revealed in you? Can we obey him without it going, oh, God, not, not today. I don't want to. Lord, deliver me. What was it? Paul said three times I prayed for this to be removed, this thorn of the flesh. And what well, God did God go, granted, like a genie, okay, just rub the lamp and I'll just. No, 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 no. He said, my grace is sufficient. What does grace do? My grace is sufficient for you. And it comes teaching us to deny ourselves. Everybody say, deny myself. Deny myself. So that we could live what? Yes, that we could live what? Can anybody quote that? The grace of God, which bringeth salvation, has appeared unto all men, teaching us that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly, and godly in this present world. Oh, some people think, oh, we're going to get to heaven, and then we're going to get these white robes, and, and, and you know, then I'll be, per then I'll be, no, we're going to live it now. In fact, if you don't live it now, what different, you know? You think it's going to mean anything to you there? You didn't live it here. You suddenly think instantly you're going to be changed and, you know, it never meant nothing to you. Never stood for anything. We never become, became a, a partaker of the fellowship of his suffering. Suffering of what? He that suffered, has suffered in the flesh, has what? Can anybody quote that scripture? Hath ceased from sin. Yes, amen. That's the glory. Peter's talking about. So don't think it's strange you're going to get tested on this stuff. Don't think it's strange that those new shoes that are the gospel of peace. You're going to walk different. Okay? Yeah, we've got to break them in. And you're going to find out you don't stretch the shoes. The shoes stretch you. The breastplate of righteousness wasn't made to fit you. God makes you fit it. Whew! Those things that you used to do, you can push them away now because you get down to your fighting weight. You push it away enough. You start building up some spiritual muscle of faith. You start building up spiritual understanding and power and wisdom. Those shoes are never going to fit you. You're going to fit the shoes. You're going to fit the helmet of salvation. Some of us, Lord bless us, we get a fat head. We get an ego going. We get high-minded. We're going to tell God what he should do for us instead of saying, no, not my will, but thy will be done. I want to fit his armor. He's not going to fit mine. But also the devil is not in charge of you or your destiny. He's not the lord of anything. He's not some, uh, I think that's Greek mythology that you would look into where you think he's Hades, lord of the dead, and he's lord of hell and all that. He's not in charge of hell. God is. You think the devil really wants to be near us in a fiery trial? No way. The fire that purifies and cleanses us will be the same fire that torments him. The devil can't burn you. There's no scripture that suggests that Lucifer ever had charge of fire. The closest he ever got was walking around the altar of God that has hot rocks on it. And our prayers pass up through that altar, creating a sweet perfume for God. You think the devil doesn't know the value of prayer? He understands better than we do at times. If we can just get in us that the power of prayer, that that but that God is the only one with authority and power over fire. So we need to take heart and not fear the fiery trial. We're just getting a nice hot bath in the spirit. God's purifying us 
so we can shine like him. He's molding us. Who's ever watched a blacksmith making a sword? I've watched that. And it's a process of pound, pound, pound. Stick the rod in the fire. Take it out. Stick it in the water. And pound, pound, pound. Okay, now back in the fire. Now stick it in the water. And pound, pound, pound. Again and again and again. And stick that rod back in the fire till eventually it's taking shape. It's becoming something of use. It's becoming something that has purpose. God's making us so that we can have use and purpose. I look up that scripture where it says he, he will make us his battle axe. Oh. You know what a battle axe is? I found, uh, it's, it's a Norwegian. Uh, the Vikings used them. The, it, the, the battle axe was the weapon of your elite. If somebody encountered a Viking soldier with a battle axe in their hand, they knew they had reached somebody who had seen more than a couple of battles. Only the most experienced, the strongest, the most valiant in battle, the most faithful in battle that wouldn't run, but would stand and get in the face of the enemy. They got to carry a battle axe. So if you saw them coming at you, you better run. You better run. And who is God making his battle axe? Us. How does that happen? You begin to pray. You begin to fast. You go through the fire and you just take it and you go, devil, you're lying. You're not in charge of me. You're not burning me. I'm burning you in Jesus' name. I'm not putting up with you. Anything I have to walk away from, I'm going to walk away from because God is purifying. He sits as a refiner's fire. You feel like you can't walk. You can't do it. You can't run. Don't worry. God is sitting there with you. He's patient. He's not sitting there with his arms folded, tapping his foot impatiently. He's with you. Whatever you're struggling with, don't worry about it. Cast your cares on him. Keep doing it. And he says this. It's not just cast your cares. It's learn of me. Amen. Cast your cares and learn of me. And I will give you rest. He's there. And he's purifying you. And before too long, whoo, those weights. All right, man. They don't feel like weights anymore. You got some muscle. You got some power. You think the devil wants to hang around that? Oh, I don't think so. We've got power in our mind. God writes his law in our mind. He's refining us in his spirit and in his truth. So great. You speak in tongues? Get in the Bible. So this week, look up two scriptures a day and write them down on being separate or separation. Look them up every day and just see and pray, God, I want this word in my heart. Purify me. Cleanse me. So God is with us in conclusion. It's going to be okay. Whether it's day or night. Or we're in the fire. We're going to stay in the church next to mama. And by our dad. Our faithful heavenly father. Whose eyes see us. He says I'll guide you with my eye. Let's turn to 2 Chronicles 16.9. Whoever gets there first stand up and read it. 2 Chronicles 16.9. But God's eye is on us, and he's ready to help us, abiding faithful, teaching us how to do the same. God knows how to walk and be holy. He came to earth and manifest as a human being. That's who Jesus Christ is. And he walked the walk. He was tempted in all points like us. Everything you can be tempted with. You think he didn't want to get a hold of those high priests someday and thrash them, lying to him, humiliating, lying about him. He was tempted. Sure he was. So whenever you're there, whoever's got Second Chronicles 16.9, please stand up and read it. Yeah. 
Amen. Amen. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of them, uh, of them whose heart is perfect toward him. He's looking at you. He sees you. You're, you're not alone. Does it ever feel like Jesus is asleep in your boat? He knew. He could be, as a man, he could be asleep in the boat. The Almighty God, the Spirit of God in him, knew exactly what was going on. God didn't sleep. He, I just shared that with a sister today. He that keepeth Israel will neither slumber, neither will he sleep. He's watching us. He's watching over it. He's going to guide you. So whether you're in the fire, you're in the work of God, and it's, it's tiring. Yeah, I admit it. I get tired sometimes doing the work of God. But I love it. I'd rather spend my life doing this, helping someone else find what I've got, find peace, find joy, find goodness, find power. Is there anyone here who can say that when you have turned to God, that his power wasn't waiting for you? That you just you begin to pray, God, help me. Lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil. That whatever you were facing didn't just melt away. It just evaporates. He's there for you. He loves you. So abide with him. I get to go to Jesus' house. I get to hang out with Jesus. The mind of all minds. I get to sit and pick his brain. If I'll take the time and study to show myself approved. And he'll be there. Waiting for you, waiting for me. I get to abide with him. Yes. The one who loves me. The one who cares for me. So if you find life getting hard for you, start abiding. We don't want to be like Peter who he, he followed afar off. I want to draw near. I want to be close to the Lord because he loves me and he loves you. Yes. Lord bless you, church. The power waits for you. Yes. Walk in it.